know, as a Catholic pastor, I get to interview a lot of people about their understanding of the Christian faith, you know, through doing pastoral references for those who want to teach in the publicly funded Catholic school system. In sacramental preparation, that's probably where I get a lot of contact, talking to parents about the baptism of their children, students about their first communion, their confirmation, couples about their upcoming wedding, and so on. You know, in the confessional, there too uh, is an opportunity to get a sense of how people understand the faith. The RCIA, that is the preparation of adults for baptism and confirmation and for reception into the church from other Christian communities, this offers a look into what you might call the popular theology of Christianity, and it's, it's interesting what you learn. You know, as a Protestant minister, I didn't have anywhere near these kinds of opportunities to just sort of consult with people, see where they're at, what their faith means to them. Now, what I'm about to say might sound like a criticism, and, and in a sense, I guess it is. But let me first say that almost all these folks that I, I talk about in, these, in connection with uh, discussing the faith, they are, by and large, good-hearted. They have faith in Christ. They're trying to be his disciples. They're earnest. But, you know, lately I've grown inclined to move quickly to the point in these talks, to be blunt, to just ask it straight up. What is the Christian faith as you understand it? Now I get some very good answers. I hear about forgiveness. I hear about mercy, service, sacrifice for others as essential elements of the Christian life. All really good things to hear. Some are quite clever. They're, they're clever enough to rummage through the clauses of the Apostles' Creed. And that's not a bad way to review what the faith is about because, well, that's what the creed is for. Do you know what I never hear anybody talk about? Nobody ever mentions it. Never. I, I sat there and thought, no, before you make an absolute statement like that, just, just think about it. Has anybody ever given this answer? The resurrection. Never. It hardly ever, ever comes up. And I mean both the Easter rising of our Lord from the dead and our resurrection which is absolutely tied to Christ's. Now, this isn't to say that, that none of these people believe in the resurrection. It just doesn't appear to be an idea they start from. It's not what you might call the foundation of their faith, or rather, like the foundation of a house, uh, nobody gives it any thought until there's something wrong, and there's water in the basement. And I'll say this, when you look at the church today, in that larger sense, there's water in the basement. There are cracks everywhere in the walls down there. I can't help but guess that the issue is the resurrection and that it's no longer being consciously part of the faith for so many. And I think that's the result of an unacknowledged schism within our Western civilization. You know, we're Catholics, we all know about the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation as a great split. But within that divide, on both sides of the Protestant-Catholic split, we can readily detect another schism between what you might call cultural Christianity and ecclesiastical Christianity, those who go to church and those who don't. We all kind of keep Christmas in our own way. We all have values that we clearly see stemming from our connection to Christ. All have a sense of the good being rooted somehow in Christianity, whether they go to church or not. You know, last week, uh, this came to the fore when I did a graveside funeral service and there were people there who, if you are aware of how the funeral rites for the Catholic Church go, no one can speak at the Mass, but at the graveside, that's a moment when people can offer personal reflections. And there were a couple of people who wanted to express themselves at that time, and of course I gave them leave to do that. And the sentiments I heard, I've heard so many times in that situation when I've allowed folks to talk and, and uh, speak, over and over again, they'll condition their marks by saying, well, I don't know if there's a heaven. Or, I don't know if there's a life after this one. And there's this complete and utter unconscious, I think, doubt that as Christians, or nominally Christians, they're standing there expressing a profound doubt in the things that they've been taught about life after death, heaven, and a God who keeps the soul of the faithful departed in his care. Again, you know, the particular person who spoke at that on this most recent occasion, th there was no monster speaking there. I mean, this is a fellow member of this shared civilization who respectfully bows the head at the prayers, but I get the sense 
doesn't know the reality of the God we pray to, or of the reasonable hope that we should have, or of the reality of the resurrection that is the foundation of that hope. You know, the faithful and those who've drifted away find common ground in the things that derive from Christ's resurrection. But we're no longer sharing in the belief in that source. You know, I previously mentioned Tom Holland's book, Dominion, and one of its central conclusions. Now, Holland's not a man of faith, but he's an historian of great integrity. And he says of Western civilization and all who belong to it, that, they are all, that we are all Christians, most of us now unconscious Christians. And maybe we're not good Christians, but we're Christians nonetheless. He says that because of this deep and broad knowledge of the Christian era, that anyone who puts forward the idea that our beliefs in inherent human dignity, human rights, democratic practices, and so on, derive from the ancient world prior to Christianity, prior to the coming of Christ into the world, that somehow come from, say, democratic Athens in particular, he says that's all utter nonsense. You don't know what you're talking about. Secularists, desperate to discount Christianity's legacy, often look to pagan Greece of antiquity as the font of our civilization. But Holland is always quick to disabuse. Anything that we see there as the progenitor of what we have today is just a whole lot of projection by people who want to deny Christ. The ancient world was brutal. And into that merciless world came the gospel and the news of the resurrection. You know, today we're reading quite a bit from St. John, uh, a letter, a portion of a letter, and a portion of his gospel. Now, John's writings, these are said to reflect not just the thoughts and remembrances of St. John, who you'll recall is the youngest of the apostles, but also the community he led in his years at Ephesus, where he made his home, and we'll also remember he cared for Our Lady, Mary. Now, the scholarly consensus about the gospel is that it is the last of the four in our Bible to be written. And that was at the end of the apostolic age. The oldest fragment of this gospel, indeed it's the oldest fragment of any of the gospels ever found, dates to about 110 AD. So a reasonable chronology is that John began to write his account in the late 80s or early 90s as he entered old age. And in that time, that would have been extreme old age. He'd be in his 60s, going into his 70s. If you sit down and read the four gospels in succession, you're going to notice how different the Gospel of John is. Now what's really striking about John, Gospel and letter writer, is he is utterly forthright about who Jesus is and who God is. It's almost brash in tone in comparison with the other Gospels of the biblical canon. And the argument is well made that John is writing in reaction to the other Gospels that were well in circulation among the early churches, that he knew at least one of them well. Now, John isn't contradicting Matthew, Mark, or Luke. However, we see him bringing out other stories and stressing other themes in Jesus' ministry. You know, where, for example, the other three pick up on what's that, that common theme of secrecy. John portrays Jesus as being, well, really an open secret to the world. And one suspects that Jesus telling his disciples to keep quiet about him had less to do with covering up what was obvious than keeping their own half-formed speculations to themselves so as not to confuse the people Jesus wanted to reach. Boy, we still have a lot of those people around who want to offer their half-baked ideas about what true Christianity is, how to modernize it, reform it, make it more palatable. Another striking distant difference from the earlier Gospels is the progression in the insistence on the substantial reality of the resurrection. If you read Matthew and Mark, there are almost no details about the encounters with the resurrected Lord. Luke comes a little later, and we have the first story of Jesus demonstrating the reality of the resurrected body. In John, we have the story of Jesus telling the Apostle Thomas to stick his fingers in the wounds. Put your hand in my side. John, who was there, must have come to the conclusion that the sensitivities of his audience about ooh, the gore of it all had to be ignored and overcome. And the real visceral experience of seeing Jesus Christ risen from the dead needs to be communicated unambiguously. Why? 
We can only speculate, but clearly, as the church emerged from out of the Jewish community, as it met the pagan religious world, as it moved in time away from the foundational event of the re resurrection, affirming the reality of it became an urgent matter so that the gospel was championed, not just as another religion derived from a myth, but a truth that has come to us in history. A great temptation is to make a Christianity that compartmentalizes the resurrection, sequesters it, so, so to speak, as something, you know, we can settle in our minds later so that we can believe the other good things we hear in the Gospels. But you can't customize it. It's a package. To make of this faith a religion of neighborliness and good works is to miss the point of it, that it is about the eternal salvation of souls and the fulfillment of our brief lives in entering into the fullness of life with God. Focus on that, and all the other good things come along. Jettison it, and the other things begin to fall away. As we've seen in our society grown decadent, corrupt, where we see lately disturbing rationalizations being offered for violence, persecution, retribution, in the name of some kind of twisted notion of justice. Absent the resurrection, it's easy to strip out the commandments, eliminate the discipline of piety, the study of faith, the practice of self-control, and true sacrifice of self. It's surmised that, you know, that's the reasonable way of life, though. We can all enjoy our little time and pleasurable pursuits, follow the golden rule, and go to our graves with some small sense of satisfaction at having spent our time well. But if the resurrection is real, our practical compromises with the world are what is false. John in his epistle today says, that's not going to work. You need to love God and obey his commandments. Love him because it is his love that raises us from the dead. You know another St. John, uh, St. John Henry Newman, in a sermon spoke of the unattractiveness of Christianity, quite frankly, you know, authentically lived Christianity. And he saw in a lot of the English aristocracy of his day, because that was his audience, he was a member of the elite, he preached to them, he saw their exhibitions of nominal Christianity, their Christianity of social propriety, of keeping up appearances, of virtue signaling. He said, you know, the very terms religion, devotion, piety, conscientiousness, mortification, and the like, you all find to be inexpressibly dull and cheerless. You cannot find fault with them, but you would if you could. His point was from the outside, it does look too hard and is without obvious benefit. As fellow Englishman G.K. Chesterton quipped famously, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. I would say again that the problem lies in the resurrection and the failure to believe in it, really put one's faith in it. I hope and pray that among the church going, it is a matter of misunderstanding. I fear among those absent from us, it is a lack of faith. And much of that comes from the church's failure to effectively proclaim it, explain it, invite others into the mystery of it. If we could bring to all an understanding of how the victory of God, who is love, is seen fully in the resurrection, how it is both a real event and a real invitation to us all, then our love of God as expressed in keeping his commandments is then no great challenge. And words like piety and devotion, well, they won't seem dull, but are seen as expressions of unspeakable joy. Amen.